Hey, you. Yes, you, the listener. You can turn your great idea into a reality with Squarespace. They make it easier than ever to launch your passion project, whatever that might be. You just want to get it online and do it in the best way because, hey, it's the future. That's where things are. So don't wait. Head to squarespace.com slash cracked for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code cracked to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Folks, I have an announcement to make that I never stop getting a kick out of making. The Cracked Podcast is coming to Chicago, Illinois, and coming to St. Paul, Minnesota this spring for our first ever tour. We are doing special custom live podcasts at Lincoln Hall in Chicago, Thursday, April 11th, Amsterdam Bar and Hall in St. Paul, Twin Cities, Minnesota, USA, Friday, April 12th. One more time, Chicago, April 11th, St. Paul, April 12th. Tickets are on sale. They're linked in this episode's Foot Newts. Uh, in my experience, uh, fans of the Cracked Podcast are 100% geniuses and saints all the time. So I'm excited to meet more of them because that's, that's a nice experience for me. And I hope you'll join us for those very special, very touring live shows this spring. It's going to be one of my favorite things of the entire year. I already know it. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey there, folks. Welcome to another episode of The Cracked Podcast, the podcast all about why being alive is more interesting than people think it is. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm the head of podcasting here at Cracked. I'm also known as Schmitty the Clam. I'm also known as Schmitty the Champ. And I am also, also thrilled you have joined us here in the distant future year of 2019. And extra thrilled you're about to join us in the year 19. Yeah, just uh, 19. You know, just BC, AD, either way. Uh, because today's episode is about the most popular era of history that was 2,000 years ago. Our topic is overrated myths and underrated facts about ancient Rome. Yeah, we're talking Romans. And with anything like that, my instinct is to give you a brief primer on what ancient Rome was and when it was. And, and here's a very brief one. Rome started as a settlement ruled by a king in the 700s BC, and then it grew and became a republic, then it grew more and became an empire not too long after the death of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, and then emperors ruled for about another 500 years from there, and I just, I can feel you getting bogged down in the numbers already, it's okay. We're talking about Rome in a very broad way, and also getting into all kinds of cool specifics, most of which is driven by your cultural idea of it. Because you you have a mental picture of ancient Rome, I'm pretty sure. It is one of the most popular settings and topics in not even just pop culture. I think ancient Rome might be the only thing that has been covered in William Shakespeare and old Hollywood and modern Hollywood and the Bible, right? All four of those. I think the only, the only commonality might be Rome and, and references to Christianity. That, that's about it. And so from all those stories, you they're all kind of samey, too. You know what they look like. Soldiers in red, emperors in togas, pillars, gladiators, swords, sandals, people fooling around, people eating, you know, all that stuff. And today we're getting into how all those tales over the years have both confused us about who the Romans actually were and skipped over some of the most fascinating things about them, a lot of which are pretty new discoveries. We're going to get into scholarship from like, you know, 2018 and 2017, which is pretty neat. And that's because we have neat guests. I'm very excited to talk to these people. One of them is a returning guest, Siobhan Thompson. We're so happy to have her back on the show. You've seen her on College Humor, BBC America, Comedy Central, and more as a writer and performer. Siobhan also grew up in the Roman ruin-filled southwest of England near the town of Bath. Uh, she grew up studying archaeology, and that was sort of her early field in life. And so this is something she's really enthusiastic about and grew up around in Britain. And we have a new guest on the program who I had the extreme pleasure of meeting when I got to be on Jeopardy. Yeah, you know, remember I was uh, I was on Jeopardy for a while? It was a whole thing, whole deal with that. And uh, if you saw me, you most likely saw Patrick Wyman, who is an absolute gent. He's a very funny guy. Uh, he's written for sites like Deadspin about everything from politics to MMA. He holds a PhD in history, and you may know him from his great hit podcast he makes. One is called The Tides of History, and its predecessor is The Fall of Rome. Believe it or not, he he knows a thing or two about the Romans. He has a PhD and has done whole podcasts about them, and I'm so glad TV Random Chance kind of brought us together, and I'm glad all three of us got to dig into this. We had the best time doing it. 
So let's let you hear it. Please sit back or tell your servants to grab some paint and start giving the Roman statues on your estate uh, some colorful zhuzh. You know, just really zhuzh it up. It'll also be more historically accurate. Either way, here's this episode of The Cracked Podcast with Siobhan Thompson and Patrick Wyman. I'll be back after we wrap up. Talk to you then. I am so excited to be talking about the ancient Romans. Yay. This is the greatest. We were, we were talking on the way in. We never get to do this, you know, in yeah. life. It just never comes up. Well, <laughs> mostly just because people don't know anything about it and their frame of reference for the Romans is like gladiator. And as we're looking at this, we have all kinds of myths and facts about them to talk about. Uh, but also, Shivani suggested we get into like the historiography, the process of how Rome's been written about, which I'm, yeah. I'm sure you both know quite a bit about. I mean, I feel like with the Romans, um, we in the West, especially like uh, us colonial powers, yeah. Britain and Britain and America, <laughs> put a lot of our own shit on the Romans. You get sort of two schools of thought about the Romans. One, they're the people that killed Christ. Oh, um, yeah. and they were very bad and fed Christians to the lions. <laughs> And two, they are the great, good patriarchal conquerors who integrated people into their system, and anybody <laughs> could be a Roman within the Roman Empire, even slaves could become Romans. Everybody wanted to be a Roman, you know, and sort of the truth of both of those things is shadier and more mixed in with each other than is ever really talked about. Yeah, it's the desire to both see ourselves and see the opposite of ourselves in the Romans simultaneously, which sometimes means that the actual Romans get left to the side right. a little bit, right. not a little bit, a lot. I mean, you end, it ends up the lenses through which we view the Romans and, and the ones that you pointed out are really important ones. Like those distort the actual facts of what life for the Romans was like, and especially their mindsets. I right. think the past is always a foreign country. You're always, you're always yeah. talking to people who are effectively aliens, whose assumptions about how the world is supposed to work differ really drastically from our own in ways that we're not always aware of. So that more than anything else is what puts the Romans out there because you, you look at a thing that they did gladiatorial games being a good example mm -hmm. of that. And you end up trying to read it through modern lenses, and that's not how people at the time interpreted it, felt it, the kind of meaning that it had for their lives. So even these things that we're all super familiar with about the Romans, gladiatorial games, coliseums, feeding Christians to lions, uh, yeah. these these things take <laughs> on meanings that they, uh, meanings for us that they didn't have for them. Within the history of the 21st century, the way that we've analyzed the exact same set of facts mm -hmm has changed very dramatically based on our own political viewpoint. I think a great example of that is Bath. And I'm saying this because I know more about it because I grew up there and had to do a lot of school projects about it, um, <laughs> on it if I'm being honest. But Bath um, at Quaisulis is, is like, oh, it's a Roman town. It, the waters of Sulis, who was a Celtic goddess, the Romans came in and the old story was the Romans came in and they created this town that was a link between the Romans and the Celts. They created a new god, Sulis Minerva, who was a combination of the old goddess and then the Roman goddess Minerva. Oh, very creative. Yeah. yeah. Um, and everybody lived in peace and harmony. Later in the 20th century, people had another look at it and went, well, hang on, the Romans came in and they built a Roman road straight through the Celtic temple of Sulis. And oh. actually, maybe the joining of the two gods was a subjugation of Sulis and the Celtic religions and not a joining together. Yeah, and wow. Both of those things could be true. We have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think that gets at the heart of kind of the ambiguity of the Romans. And I think in more peaceful times, people are more inclined to read the Romans peacefully. Mm -hmm. And in times that feel a little more disruptive or where you're playing out a lot of power imbalances in the world, you tend to see more the violent side of what the Romans did and the, and the subjugating side. Like, I think the 90s were a time where everybody was very, like, peace and harmony with uh, the Romans. Like, there's, oh, a, yeah. there's a book called Becoming Roman. Uh, that a, a, a great archaeologist slash historian named Greg Wolf wrote about the process by which, you know, you kind of rebuilt the environment and people bought into be the idea of being Roman out in the provinces. Totally a 90s thing. I think more recent works are tend to take a more critical view and think like, oh, you know, there was a definitely an iron fist inside a velvet glove that went along with the that right. went along with wow. getting people right, to become Roman. There were baths, but there were also crucifixions. Yeah. <laughs> like those two things existed in in some sort of harmony, mm -hmm. but also, I guess, a sort of chaos. The Romans. 
people have been writing Roman history different ways just in those couple decades, depending on how we felt about globalization, I guess, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, like, <laughs> like whether it's just something everybody's excited about or being put on them or, or in between. Oh, I'll give you a perfect example of that. So the stuff that I really worked on was the fall of the Roman empire. And obviously that can be a fairly yeah. charged subject, especially when people are in the mood of seeing something through the lens of imperial decline. Uh, that's <laughs> it, when, when people why, are in Why that would mood. that be relevant? To any of us? <laughs> I have no idea. It's in this upswing we're in. It's an entire mystery. But, th <laughs> but things like immigration, were the barbarians invading conquerors or were they peaceful migrants or, well, you know, not really either. I mean, they were like some barbarian groups were perfectly happy to pillage and plunder and kind of set themselves up. And others were actually straightforwardly immigrants, many of them who had been assimilated into the institution of the Roman army. And from there, got a political will to do uh, to do things that eventually contributed to the downfall of the Roman Empire, you know? If you're in a mood to see immigration as kind of a, a real negative thing, then that's going to give you a certain valence through which to look at the, the end of the Roman Empire. I love that we're talking about there's not only these centuries of Roman history, but centuries of people writing Roman history. Right. And, and as I understand it, one of the biggest ones was Edward Gibbon who wrote the, the decline famous decline and fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> oh, that's the best way to read the title. And if, from what I've read about it, because I haven't read the whole thing, is that Nobody one of his has, big, don't worry about no, it. No, but yeah, it's like eight volumes or something. It's ridiculous. so long. Yeah. <laughs> it's so long. <laughs> they, from what I've heard about it, one of his big things is just that essentially immigration killed the empire. He's like, oh, uh, people came in who were different and that blew it up. Immigration and Christianity. Like Gibbon yeah. really thought that Christianity made the Romans weak and effeminate and destroyed their kind of civic <laughs> mindedness like because Gibbon was a, a dude of the 1770s this was he was very much this kind of a, a part and parcel of the enlightenment, you know, like he was friends with Adam Smith. That's like, that's wow. Gibbon was yeah. part of this intellectual milieu and his ideas about these things were not separable from the broader trends of the enlightenment, you know, like he was an enlightenment guy bringing enlightenment, like what he thought of as rationality to the, to the question of the decline and fall of Rome. Yeah, he was from Powdered Wig Times. And he so he yeah. had all these Powdered Wig Times ideas about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's also, again, talking about strange times in history when two existing ideas that don't seem to make any sense together are happening. It's also the time of the witch hunts. Like, there's, there's the Enlightenment, but there's also, I'm going to uh, have a silver jar filled with pins and piss, and I'm going to keep that on my body at all times so that witches can't get me. <laughs> <laughs> Humans are... Crazy. Yeah. I mean, one of our sponsors is Jars of Pins and Piss. So if we can just please, <laughs> you know what? Um, not I'm plug supportive in there. of them, Pick and I think that they're uh, really <laughs> disrupting the Pins and Piss industry. So. <laughs> Rome, as we look at it, I feel like it's such a mix of very advanced things and then also things that at least to our minds are maybe brutal or difficult. And yeah. one of them's gladiators. What a thing that's in like every movie about oh, every the Romans. Movie. Yeah. Uh, we'll just call the movie Gladiator and everyone lines up. They're just outside all of a sudden, you know, and that's a very fun myth. It seems like because basically all the things that we take for granted about gladiators in pop culture are not that true. Just kind of made up. Yeah. And I feel like maybe a lot of that is because that's the first thing that you learn about the Romans, because it's a fun way to teach kids about history because children are inherently violent and then <laughs> they, they oh, love yeah. fighting. And so it's like, look, the Romans had fighting that you could watch and there's different types and you can learn them. And there's the guy with the, the, the stick and the, the net and there's the guy with the sword and the shield and all these different specific types of guys. <laughs> My like first thing about history I was interested in was this guy, Alexander, who just kicked a bunch of butt all over the place, Great. you know, and because yeah. that was my name. It was very exciting. And, and that, that works. That did it. Yeah. Oh, dude, I got a biography of William the Conqueror when I was like six. And I'm like, wait, his name is William. And they called him the Conqueror. Like, tell me more about this. Yeah, I'd like to subscribe. You know, not many famous <laughs> Siobhan's. i got to say, oh, it's no. not a thing that I had, not an experience that. that I had. I guess so. I, for all of the young Siobhan's out there, I will conquer <laughs> <laughs> I will fall down on the beaches of England and grab it and say, this earth is in my hands. 
<laughs> gladiators are great because they are basically everybody's entry point. They are the one thing that everybody knows about. And it's because on I, on one hand, it's entirely alien. The idea that you have like, you know, bare chested, oily, muscled dudes in an arena just killing each other with swords for the entertainment of the crowd is a deeply alien thing to us. But on right. the other, the idea of mass spectacle and entertainment that gets everybody, you know, out of their houses and into a common space is something that's deeply familiar to us. Yeah, so for sure. you get that you get those two things happening simultaneously. And also you get just glorious images for anything that for right. any film or TV show, like just just real, really slow it down, do it 300 style, you know? Yeah, it's a real <laughs> easy plug in for a screenwriter. It's like, yeah. oh, we're, we're doing something with the Romans. Let's have a big fight. Yeah, oh, yeah. you know where they had big fights in public. They had all kinds of stuff there. You can have a race. You can have a bear fight. You can have bears fighting. Like how many lions versus how many bears? And you know. Yeah, yeah. I forgot that they even have the equivalent of NASCAR with chariots, and then mm -hmm. also gladiators. Yeah. Which, like, we there are modern NFL players who wore the mask from the movie Gladiator before the game, or did like a speech that was based on Gladiator because it's just it's just that fun, dude. I, yeah. So I used to cover mixed martial arts as a journalist, and yeah. I cannot tell you how many guys have Gladiator tattoos. Like how many oh, fighters? Man. Oh, no. one, one they are the exact right age for that. That makes actually a lot of sense <laughs> because perfect, they were yeah. twelve when the movie came out, mm -hmm. yeah. and now they're MMA fighters. Uh, well, in these gladiators, I feel like a lot of the lure is oh, fighting to the death. What a that's a real sport, mm -hmm. right? Where all the guys die, and uh, it turns out that wasn't a thing that often. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty. It was pretty rare. I mean, so. You find the occasional tombstone of a gladiator. There are a lot of them in the city of Ephesus in uh, in what's now Turkey. So there's one dude you see his tombstone and he's like he was 34, 6 and 10. So he won 34, lost 6 and then he had 10 draws. But like if you're if every fight is to the death, right. then that dude is not like a he lost 6 fights so right. he didn't die 6 times. Yeah. And also how do you have draws if the fight is supposed to be to the death? And uh, also I think the dude I don't think the guy died in a fight. Like, I think he was a retired gladiator. You get all of this evidence that says, no, our common image of this is not to the death. You also get um, when you see skeletons of gladiators, not that we found a lot of them, but the, the kind of physical remains suggest that there were lots of healed injuries. Those all didn't happen in training. Like, you, oh, wow, there were, yeah. there's lots of evidence for gladiators getting really good medical care because if you think about it. These are valuable commodities. If they're slaves, like these are people that you've invested a lot of time and money in. You give them good medical care and you're not going to spend all that time and money on somebody to have them go out and die once. Like that's not right. that's not the economics of that don't make sense. <laughs> yeah, it's silly, and I I feel like a lot of it. it uh, our idea of that is also probably uh, post Roman Christian propaganda of like, mm. well, how do we make the Romans seem less civilized than we, the med people of medieval Europe, who do not again have public baths or viaducts <laughs> or all of the other crazy like amazing things that the Romans had. How can we make them less civilized than us? Well, they killed each other all the time. Yeah, that's yeah. That, sport. <laughs> you can see that happens. That happens with some early Christian writers. It happens in the the fourth century with Saint Augustine. You know, one of the all time all time great Christian theologians and writers. Yeah. Um, Augustine has a passage in his in his Confessions, like his uh, kind of like autobiographical text that he does, uh, where he's talking about how his friend got super into the gladiators and he would go and he would and he would try <laughs> to look away, but he couldn't. It was just too intoxicating. And so there was a sense even among these early Christian writers that they, that with gladiators, you were watching something that was, that was seductive. Like there was an allure to the violence to draw that drew people in and got them really into it. And I always identified with that because if you've ever been to a fight, like if you've ever been to a, a boxing match or a, a big mixed martial arts fight, there's that same kind of energy there, that same kind of sense that like you can't look away from what's happening. Yeah, so, sure. But but yeah, but even so early on, like you right. get this sense that this is a bad thing that you shouldn't be doing. It's a sinful thing for Christians. I also wow. think that like it's worth talking about that the Romans just had a different relationship to death than mm -hmm. we do as Western people who live in a, a Christian society yeah. or Abrahamic society. I mean, for example, like if a Roman general lost a battle, he would kill himself. Like that was a pretty normal thing that happened within the Roman Empire. Because, like, everybody else died, so he has Yeah, to... it's like, well, I'm going to fall on my sword. 
It, oh, right. Yeah. The famous phrase. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. The the Romans did have a different relationship to death and also a different relationship to putting yourself into dangerous positions that like we always have to, again, going back to the historiography of it, we have to try and understand their motivations and understand that they're different from ours. Yeah, yeah. With that, like, they were comfortable enough with death that a few gladiators died yeah. in the ring. It happened some of the time. Absolutely. But it's not like football players don't die. I, I feel they're dying in slow motion, honestly. Yeah. But, it, but it is, it is, I know what you mean. I mean yeah. It's just like the... <laughs> Again, from Ephesus, there's one school that very clearly has, like, an impression of the dude got stabbed through the head with a trident. And that's, oh, you that's can so match cool. up like that. You can match up like a trident with the with the entry wounds on the skull. So like dudes de very definitely did get killed. And there are also skeletons from, I think, York in England, mm -hmm. which is so w where there was a huge very savage people. from York. <laughs> <laughs> Slander to the Yorkshiremen, uh, which was a huge army base. It was one of the major military bases in Roman Britain. Uh, but so gladiatorial games were very popular among soldiers. And there it might have been a little rougher because these were all like dead people who were probably gladiators in this in this graveyard they found and they had been decapitated. Oh. So that was probably a thing like, oh, this is a cool thing. We just do it for the soldiers. You know, the guy's dead. We'll take his head off, too, because there's like clear damage to the to the vertebra of the neck like this dude had his head hacked off. It's possible that they were just condemned criminals who were who were getting put out there and put to death, probably in entertaining fashion. But if they were actually professional gladiators, then they did die that way. And they also were just decapitated for funsies. Wow, skeletons are telling us so much here. It's yeah. really, it's really handy. You can tell a lot from a skeleton. A lot, yeah. Especially trident guy, man. Yeah, diet uh, as well. Didn't um, I? I saw on your little cheat sheet that a lot of them were vegetarians. Patrick, you mentioned that, right? Which yeah, is so, amazing. Yeah, so uh, they they tended to eat a diet that was really high in vegetables. May have actually been just straight up vegetarian. We can tell that because of the the ratios of isotopes that you find in their, especially their dental enamel. It's a good source for telling wow. us uh, for telling us about past diet. But also, they ate a diet that was very high in strontium. What is strontium? I so st strontium is a mineral, and, and there's some evidence to suggest that it helps with bone regrowth. So if you're constantly doing a lot of damage to your bones, then having a diet that's high in strontium can help you recover from those kinds of injuries and build stronger bones moving forward. It also confirms that gladiators were, were said to have had like a special kind of tonic drink kind of like, like an, a sports drink that you have after a workout uh, <laughs> that, that was very, really high in strontium. It involved a lot of ash. And yeah, so it was. Wow. But, so the uh -huh. skeletal evidence confirms this, that. Are uh, you hearing people up in Silicon Valley who are looking for your next investment? <laughs> yeah, if you're looking to disrupt Gladiator the Gladiator venom. You just drink it and right. it's full of ash and then you grow your bones uh, back. There is a very popular <laughs> new sports drink that's doing a lot of advertising. It's called Body Armor. So gladiator drink is not worse than that that's amazing that they were so able to focus on their health and staying alive and uh and numbers vary from various studies of it but uh one historian we've got allison Fatrell, puts it at about about 20 percent of match losers dying and about 10 percent of combatants overall so most of them were living on to drink this gross sports drink <laughs> and yeah. keep going and also apparently the matches had referees yep mm -hmm. which seems very law and order and boring to us like if gladiators are cool there's no draws there's no referees there's there's just death and that's it it is always useful for us as humans to have one person saying the rules <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you know and you can't always have the roman emperor just f sort of framed by sunlight standing up at his purple robes and and putting his his thumb to the side yeah, which also, because that's very reality TV, like yeah. an eventual decision and you're fired, you know. But I guess that didn't happen either. It was the referees signaling who, whether or not the person was killed. Yeah. And also, uh, this is another thing we know from the skeletal evidence that there was a dude who, if one gladiator was like very badly injured, but not dead, who would just come out and hit him in the head with a hammer uh, to finish him off. Oh, like, what a job. Yeah, oh. we know because we found like the mark that is very obviously from a hammer on the on guys skulls. So, Man. yeah. So whether that was the same as the referee or whether that was a, whether he was pulling double duty is is hard to tell. But like, yeah, so they were highly regulated. There were procedures in place. It's I mean, you can make a, a comparison with professional wrestling that these are personalities who are out there. Um, they're famous there. It's not like your career is over if you lose one time. Uh, they're valuable commodities. They're in good shape. They eat specialized diets. They receive good medical care better than most professional wrestlers, probably. And they're kind of around, like, this is a career that you have, even if you're a slave. 
Yeah, that's so cool. It's very professional and and modern sounding. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, and also uh, one of the more famous gladiators would be Spartacus. There was a whole Kirk Douglas movie about him, and that seems to be an interesting thing where there's a lot of truth to oh, these gladiators were skilled enough warriors to actually fight the Roman army, which is amazing. You would th- you would think a professional army would knock them out. Especially that professional of an army. Because right. the Roman army was <laughs> very good at being an army. Yeah. <laughs> like, just really good at armying. <laughs> <laughs> There's evidence to suggest that the Roman army employed ex-gladiators as instructors. So I mean, you think about it this way. There's a lot that goes into being a soldier. Right? It's not just things that you do actually in battle like you've got it the roman army is building roads they're they're out patrolling you know you're doing a lot of marching there's a lot that goes into being a roman soldier that is not the actual act of killing somebody with a sword right and so if you want to learn how to do that right you go to the person who is whose entire job is killing somebody with a sword and so that's why you get kind of like these grizzled ex gladiators who are acting as as based hand to hand combat instructors for the Roman army. Like they were highly sought after. If you make it through your career as a gladiator, you can probably have a nice little second career as an instructor. Oh, like the, it's like the NFL equivalent would be you get to be a broadcaster later. Yeah. You get to talk about the game. Uh, <laughs> these guys got to train the army. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We talked a lot about uh, uh, Christians being fed to lions before, and apparently that never actually happened. It was just a story that was told in early Christian stories about uh, martyrs that were fictionalized and for fun. (laughs) Yeah, although the Romans did make the European lion extinct. So it's not like they didn't use lions a lot in their festivities. Yeah. Like there was a lot of fighting lions and a lot of lions fighting each other. And again, lions fighting bears and like how many animals versus a lion where they destroyed an entire species. Oh, boy. Uh, there, I mean, the Romans imported animals from all over the place for yeah. these kinds of things. Like bear versus giraffe is one matchup we hear about. Uh, I, they, I, well, that's unfair, right? That's, that's quick. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, have you seen a giraffe run? They're fast. They, They're are fast. Very, they have very long legs. It's true. It, giraffes are very large creatures. But the Romans <laughs> set, set out to answer all of their like animal matchup questions in the arena. But they also the Romans did feed criminals to lethal animals. That was a thing that they did pretty regularly. But that kind of speaks to the broader point of all this. The reason why this is meaningful for talking about and understanding Roman society as a whole, because it tells us a lot about how the Romans viewed death and how they viewed status. Right. right? And and how they viewed the value of life, which is to say the Romans did not think on a very basic level that human life had inherent value, that your status gave you value. So if you're a condemned criminal, then your life is only as valuable as the entertainment your death provides and the example that it sets to everybody else to say, like, if you commit a crime, you're going to be literally eaten by a wild animal in full view of the public. That yeah. So that's a way of reinforcing a kind of in a, in a deeply hierarchical society. It's a way of reinforcing whose status belongs where. And gladiators are slaves. They're like they don't have they're not real people like they like everybody else to the to the Roman way of thinking about things. For a gladiator to go out there and do that, that that reinforces your sense of what it means to be Roman, to, to be in the wow. crowd as opposed to on the sand it is an act of of affirming your own identity. And that, and that's such an amazing aspect of the many ways it seems like we have trouble with history if, if we put our values just into the heads of the people there. Like right. if we assume, oh, they're into the liberty and equality from, I don't know, the 1700s or so. <laughs> they, yeah. It's a totally different time and place. But, you know, <laughs> bread and circuses is still a thing that gets talked about today. And that is a, a yeah. Roman idea yeah. of like, well, if we if we give the people bread and circuses, they won't revolt. And that's a, a big part of, of that <laughs> entertainment system is like, make sure that they have enough festivals and also highly regulated bakers, which is another very Roman thing. <laughs> oh, that um, is. <laughs> they uh, had, every baker had a stamp so that if your bread oh. was bad, you could say, I got it from this bakery, and then they the law would go and deal with them. Because people would uh, mix in sawdust or chalk or, you know, whatever other cheap <laughs> fillers that they could uh, mix into their bread to and get away with it. And so it was a, uh, yeah. a way of regulating the bread. They had an extensive legal bread That's- system. 
That's very modern in both directions, like both a branding and food safety thing. And also we did an episode not too long ago about food where it came up that a lot of bread just has like sawdust and wood pulp and stuff in it as filler. Oh, yeah. Today, it's, anything, it's thing, anything you can stretch, the, anything you can do to stretch the flour further. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Lower, throw in, toss in some lower quality grains if you can. Do yeah. whatever you can. I think that leads well into uh, we've got a lot about just a really interesting thing that Roman cities were pretty nice in the sense of conveniences yeah. people had and stuff people had. Yeah, there was uh, extensive sewerage systems. There were extensive drainage systems. You could go and eat out. The grid system is real nice. Having, again, That's grown up great. in... Bath is a, a Roman city, but when the medieval people built right. their city on top of it, they were like, grid system, absolutely not. We'll build wherever the fuck we want. Um, and so it is, it's nice to live on a grid. You know exactly yeah. where you are and you know exactly where you're going. And, and Roman cities tended to follow, like, they all had the grid system and they also all had the buildings in pretty much the same spots. So they right. all had kind of a standard package of buildings that went along. Like oh. you had a forum, you had temples, you had buildings for public administration. Like you had some rich, like rich aristocrats who had their country villas, but then they also had city houses and they all tend to be in more or less the same places. Like there's a common kind of cultural package that goes along with Roman cities. Wow. And so you've got the grid system, you have a pretty good sense of where everything is on it, and you can pretty much always tell when the Romans built the city as opposed to when they just kind of took over a previously existing place mm -hmm. by that. Like, that's are they amazing. kind of trying to slot things into something that's already there, or are they just going to stamp their own their own kind of sense of, of Romanness and cityness down on top of, uh, down on top of a, a blank spot? I'm, I'm almost imagining, like, that stereotypical version of an old west main street where just every main street has yeah. those six buildings that you need the saloon and, and the brothel yeah. and so it's on it's like mm -hmm. imagine then, the worst suburb you know that other where they've just like all look the same and they've all got the <laughs> same kind of like faux main street type thing that they're like a planned community and the romans did that everywhere from north africa to northern britain yeah that's amazing. And it's nice as, for archaeologists because once you find a Roman town, you're like, oh, I know exactly where everything else is <laughs> oh. going to be. Uh, I'm going to go and send the geophysics team over to that field over there because that's where we will find the baths. <laughs> that's yeah, amazing. You'll, you'll find the baths. Like, and Ro the Romans in general, like I, I interviewed an archaeologist a few weeks ago who's done a lot of digging on Roman sites, and she's just like, everything is Ikea. Like everything is standardized <laughs> in the Roman world, like from, from the city plan to the kinds of pottery that you find to the tiles that you find that tell you that you had like underfloor heating, right. uh, like yeah. hypocaust tiles. Like, yeah, I mean, the pottery is so well regulated that they, it was one of the first um, sort of, archaeologists like to list things and put things in order. That's like a oh, big right, part yeah. of the, the archaeological process. I feel like everybody has this idea of archaeology where it's very glamorous and you're out finding a bunch of gold, but mostly it's like, <laughs> which uh, one of these amphorae was built before the other amphorae? Right. So it's, that when we find one in the field, we can look at it and go like, oh it has this kind of lip and therefore it's from this 10 year period but with the romans you really can tell within sometimes with with like a five year period and certainly within a 50 year period exactly when it is based on very specific things about the pottery and that's such a like mass production culture almost yeah. right like they didn't have factories factories uh, with the oh they had but... factories for sure oh, yeah. all right yeah. mm -hmm. sure great <laughs> i mean not like adam smith level factories <laughs> oh yeah but still like pretty big extensive factories and also just like specs. Like if you were providing oh, okay. things for the Roman army, you had to have them in a specific way. And especially right. if you're looking at the first wave of Roman imperialism, that's extremely useful. The Roman army was always the last stage of Roman imperialism. The first stage of Roman imperialism was always diplomatic. And uh, that's definitely something that the British Empire stole. Mm. So uh, the first stages of, of the Roman Empire were pretty much always vassal states. Uh, so you oh, go into a place and you say, hey, we will help you. And then in return in 100 years or 50 years or when you're dead and you don't have to worry about it, you're just going to give us this land. Oh. <laughs> um, and that's how I did, uh, the, the story of, of Boudicca happened is because her husband was a was a vassal of the Roman Empire. And then when he died, they came in and took like to try to take over her kingdom and she was like absolutely fucking not and then they raped both of her daughters and then oh. she burned the whole of the east coast of england super fair and then uh, she yeah. but it's in a very cool way because she was a, a celtic uh, yeah queen, she was right? a the celtic queen of iceni which is in uh what is currently uh sort of norfolk and cambridge okay eastern england yeah. yeah, but the Romans were very, very good at uh, trade that was secretly imperialistic. 
Between the time when the first Roman envoys show up and you start to get your your, your diplomatic relationship going, Roman traders just flood in. Yeah. And they're like, hey, you guys like this wine? You like this olive oil? Mm -hmm. We can get more of it. Right. So, you st so in archaeological contexts, you start to find some Roman coins. You start to find some amphorae. You find uh, a lot of things that are pretty high, like high status things. So the yeah. rich people. Because they're in, going after the rich people. They don't care about the poor people. Yeah, exactly. Oh, they're trying to yeah. assimilate the rich kind of to a, to a Roman way of thinking and a Roman way of consuming. Like Roman culture is very consumption oriented. Right. It's all about kind of the outward markers of uh, of Romanness. So the Romans didn't have a concept of ethnicity or race the way that we do. Like what made you Roman was a package of behaviors and consumption patterns. It was living in a city. It's wearing a toga. It's speaking Latin. It's uh, drinking the right kind of wine. It's knowing the difference between. And uh, watering your wine as well. It, exactly, only barbarians yeah. drank their wine unwatered. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and like, <laughs> do you, can you tell the difference between these two specific kinds of poetry? If you can do all that stuff, right. you're, you're Roman. And a lot of the vassal yeah. kings became Roman um, when the Roman Empire invaded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, that, happened very often it, 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 that's right. that's part of their plan it's like well we're going to come in we're going to take over your neighbor who you hate who also hates the romans we're going to set you up as a roman citizen and we'll build you a palace yeah we'll we'll send your we'll send your sons to get to uh to get educated with it with a uh some poor highly educated greek slave we'll we'll help you build a villa you we will make you roman Basically, the, the, the yeah, Roman it's a historian, whole package deal. Yeah, the Roman yeah. historian Tacitus writes about this, where he's about kind of the seductive power of Roman civilization, about of how nice it is to have a bathhouse and to have like really good tasting wine and all yeah. of the other kind of trappings of Romanness. And he's like, but this is this makes slaves of them. Basically, when as yeah. the Romans take Britain, it's it's a process of sucking in the aristocracy with the trappings of civilization. I, I feel like that's also interesting sort of versus pop culture, because I think in pop culture, we get a lot of the Roman army marching in and taking a place. Right. Mm -hmm. And that really was the last stage. Many thanks to Squarespace for their support of this show, because uh, we couldn't do it without them. And because you also could benefit from doing something with them. Because, hey, they provide people with websites and domains, but they do it in the best way possible because they make it so easy to build a beautiful website that is all you and exactly what you want it to be. They have templates created by world-class designers. You can customize just about anything about it with a few clicks. And before you know it, you have a beautiful website for yourself. It's also optimized for mobile right out of the box. I don't know if you've used the internet on a phone or a tablet, but if you listen to podcasts, almost definitely. You've probably done that, and you probably noticed not every website looks right on there. There's, like, weird dimensions to stuff sometimes, or, like, the scrolling's all funky. Squarespace sites are built to automatically work on that platform that almost everyone is using to see the internet now, so you'll be all set if you work with them. They also make buying domains simple. They have a 24-7 award-winning customer support team. They have everything you need, so head to squarespace.com slash cracked for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code cracked to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash cracked. Offer code cracked. In pop culture, we always just get it's one Roman Empire with one kind of legionnaire soldier in that right. outfit. We've got that outside of these gritty ones, that pop culture thing of like a Ben-Hur or, or Hill Caesar even of right. where it's just all these guys in that same outfit. But the actual Roman army was way more interesting, right? It was all yeah. these different units from all these different places that got to kind of fight the way they were used to. Right. Yeah. One of the ways that the Romans used their imperialism to their advantage was to go in and go, oh, you guys are really good at riding horses. Great. You'll be the horse guys. Yeah. <laughs> or like you guys have these very specific types of clubs that really fucked us up. Great. You're going to fuck up those guys over there now. That's your job. Right. And like, these, do you know any Trident guys? We hear oh, Trident. Oh, we love the Trident crazy. guys. They just look so cool. We could use that. <laughs> Straight through the brain. Um, and yeah, there were Roman Imperial legions that were your classic, all red and gold and the shields and all of that stuff. But then there were also ones that were more specific for a specific type of fighting style. And they would always move them a long right. way from wherever they came from to to a different frontier. Right, because you don't want people fermenting discord in the place where they know people. 
You know, oh, like, okay. oh, yeah, I'm now in the Roman army. I'm successful and I'm very powerful. And also I'm mad about this specific thing that's happening to my family. I'm going to fuck some people up. Whereas if you're <laughs> from the North African region and you've been sent to look after Hadrian's Wall in the north of England, you don't care about those people. Right. <laughs> you're just there to, to stop them from killing you and each other. That's a real common practice is you get uh, you get auxiliary units raised, say, along the along the Rhine getting sent to northern Britain or you get uh, you get people from North Africa serving in Syria. The Romans just moved people around on a huge scale. It's one of the things that makes the Roman Empire the Roman Empire right. is just huge amounts of movement of people and goods. And that's uh, actually a thing that the American army has taken up and, and used. That's the reason why you don't stay in a place for more than four years. Because they don't want people oh. talking to each other and, and uh, laying down roots in a place. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, it, it's a way of the, the elites holding power. Yeah, people movement. People moved a lot in the Roman world. It's one of the reasons why the Latin language was so homogenous is because you don't why it didn't have like really strong regional differences. Like there were accents oh. in Latin, but there weren't uh, but it was all mutually intelligible. And part of the reason for that is because people moved around so much. You get a process called dialect leveling where uh, as people move from place to place, they kind of knock out the strongest differences in the language. But I mean there were many languages spoken in the Roman Empire. It's one of our kind of myths that we have about it is that everybody spoke Latin. Well, well, first of all, the eastern half of the Roman Empire, the, the lingua franca was Greek and not Latin. But then everywhere else, you had people speaking other languages. Like Latin didn't completely knock out the the Gaulish languages, these Celtic languages in, in what's now France, until like the 4th or the 5th century AD, so four or 500 years after the Roman conquest. Oh, yeah. Uh, Basque, right. Basque obviously survives. That's a pre-Roman pre language. Basque, Breton, Welsh, Cornish, mm -hmm. uh, Irish, Gallic, Scottish, Ga Welsh. Oh. They, it's not like they invited all, all those languages were like, Scotland, but, like holdouts while Latin was coming in. Yeah, That's I mean, amazing. Brittany... Wales and Cornwall and, and the Basque country were all part of the Roman Empire and they still speak the language. Yeah, yeah, wow. There's some reason in Britain to think that the language is kind of retracted during the Roman Empire and then expanded outwards again when the Romans left. So people who people whose ancestors had been speaking a, a, a Celtic language, learned to speak Latin, gave it up, and then when the Romans left, they went back to speaking a Celtic language. And especially mentioning Greek as a language, and you said half the empire, just the whole mm -hmm. East? Yeah, the whole like East. That's, it, it, I feel like most people don't know that the Roman Empire was split into multiple organizations for a long period of time. Uh, half of it mostly spoke not Latin for the <laughs> if they chose, yeah. and uh, and then of course Patrick, you've done whole podcast about the fall of Rome, <laughs> uh, so I know I know uh, I'm not going to be like ah, wrap it up in two minutes, you know. Uh, but I feel like that basic idea of Rome fell is at least a little bit of a myth or yeah, it's more complicated. A, it's more than of a, a whimper than than we've been. Although I mean, in Britain, it's it's a harder exit than oh. than the rest of the <laughs> empire because it yeah. really was a everybody got a letter and then they left. Oh wow! Um, it was just marching orders, like yeah. we're all leaving. It was. It's like well, time to oh. defend Rome. <laughs> we got to call you guys back in. They had kind of slowly but surely been pulling troops out of Britain for for a while. Like Britain was a was a really popular spot for imperial usurpers because you have a lot of soldiers there, and you're and the oh. land itself is not in that much danger. Uh, so you get an ambitious general in Britain, and he thinks, well, I've got an army. Like the continent is right there. Like I can, I could probably just take my guys over there and make a bid for this. So in 383, a guy does that. Then another guy does in 406, 408, named Constantine the Third. Yeah. So uh, he well, was the last one to make a real, real good run at it in kind of the way that people had been making a good run at it for about 200 years beforehand. But in the aftermath of his man. usurpation, they just pulled the last troops out. So there are still kind of Roman soldiers there, but they they basically go native. It's like the it's like this kind of thing. You know, like the, the Japanese soldiers who are left over at the end of World War II on all the islands and they're like, they yeah. don't know the war is over. Like, you kind of get that thing happening, like along Hadrian's Wall, where you, people are still living in these forts. Like, there are still soldiers there, but in, but they're not getting paid. And so... Oh, problem. Yeah, so, right. so what do you do? So <laughs> you have a couple of options. One is you can just say, well, okay, I'm not a soldier anymore. Or B, you can say, okay, I guess it's time to become a local strongman. And... So in the kind of chaos of post-Roman Britain, I think a lot of kind of ex-soldiers just wind their way into being like, OK, I guess I just rule this region now. I guess this is just my spot. And um, wow. I feel like if you want to go and read up more about this, I f uh, the site at Vindolanda, I think mm -hmm. is super 
super fascinating. So Vindolanda was a Roman fort, but because of the nature of just the soil that it was built on, it's an incredibly well-preserved archaeological site, including oh. just hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of letters. And, and most of them are just things like, hi, can I borrow some butter? Or would you like to come to dinner on Tuesday? Yeah. Um, they're just little notes that people would send to each other. Because, again, Rome was an incredibly literate society. Pretty much all Roman citizens could write and read. Many of the women were also literate, which, considering it was not a particularly matriarchal society, <laughs> is, like, I think, a telling of the, the importance that was put upon literacy. Mm -hmm. And so that gives us a lot of sources now, then. Yeah, so Vindeland is fascinating because it's it's one of the first forts that's built along Hadrian's Wall, and you can really see through the archaeology that sea change, and then the pretty abrupt change when the the Roman authority left. Yeah, yeah. Br Britain is one of so when you talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, like it's really a regional thing. Right. So the eastern half of the empire never falls at all, really. It yeah. kind of slowly but surely slips away and ebbs and flows over the centuries. Right. And, and it's the, based around Constantinople and not Rome. Yes. Right. And becomes almost exclusively Greek speaking after the sixth century, like they stop using Latin. But Greeks, I mean, up until a couple hundred years ago, described themselves as Romanoi. Mm -hmm. They would not have oh. described themselves as Greek. The the Seljuk Turks when they took over in Anatolia in like the the eleventh century called themselves the Seljuks of Rome the Seljuks of Rome. Rome is a fun brand. It seems like yeah. everybody wants to have that in there. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. It has yeah, a lot I mean, of power. They were cultural imperialists. They were very very good at honestly in the same way as the U.S. is <laughs> exporting their culture to other people and saying, hey, this is this is the land of hope and glory. This is the, mm -hmm. look at all of our. Right. Uh, Great movies and delicious foods. Yeah, people <laughs> like, wanted to, people wanted to be Roman. Yeah. It was a really powerful thing. Like there's a uh, there's an epitaph. So in the in the later Roman Empire, um, you mentioned the army. Like in yeah. the after about 300 or so, the Roman army starts to recruit almost exclusively from people who lived either along the frontier or on the other side of the frontier. So it's an army that's largely made up of people who were not Roman by birth. So you get Franks and Alemanni and Goths and you know all sorts of these other groups of people, people who are like basically aspirational migrants who are coming into the Roman Empire, joining the army and using that as a way to kind of make a better life for themselves. And there's a there's a great epitaph from like kind of northern France in the fourth century where the guy says, I was born a Frank, but but I'm a Roman centurion in death. So where you see these people kind of assimilating to a Roman identity over the course of their lives. And like, this is a really powerful thing. Like this guy put it on his tombstone. Yeah. Wow. Know? And then kind of cool phrasing. I'm very impressed. Yeah. yeah. He's, yeah, it's, yeah. But you get the sense like there was there were a lot of people like this who wanted who kind of wanted to become Roman. This plays into the idea of the fall of the Roman Empire, because at the end, it's hard to tell the difference between a barbarian and a Roman soldier. And so our sources are kind of confused about this, too. Like, so. What used to get read by historians as like, oh, this invading barbarian group, it's like, well, it looks a lot like a Roman army. You know, right. if you're a Ro <laughs> if you're, you're an average Roman civilian living in the city of Rome in four in 400 A.D. and a guy comes walking down the street and he's got a sword and he's got a shield and he's got a helmet on. He's wearing pants. He's not wearing like he's not wearing like a tunic or a toga. Right. You're like, is that guy an invading barbarian or is he a Roman soldier? They wore the same thing. They spoke the same kind of like army Latin. It, w it was like heavily spiced with kind of words from beyond the frontier. They probably drank beer and not wine. Uh, they ate a diet that was had more in common with people beyond the frontier than right. uh, than with a Roman civilian. Like barbarian culture is military culture. Like there's a distinct Rome, like late Roman military culture. And these armies that end up taking over and setting up kingdoms inside Roman territory, they're mostly Roman armies that had been in service to Rome at some point. So it's not not like an invasion type thing. It's more like the Romans built this army out of these people from beyond the frontier and then they kind of got loose. Right. And that's yeah. actually is one of the theories around King Arthur is mm. that his father, Uther, uh, was a Roman centurion, but one of these 
uh, a local older R- Roman centurions where it, it's everything. It's sort of a mishmash of everything else because the name mm-hmm. Uther means bear. But like it's, King Arthur is so back, so far back in history it's, well, that but it's, it's probably yeah. connected somehow and to the it's Romans. Because it's, it's post-Roman, but because it's the, the Dark Ages, we don't know anything about it. And <laughs> most of our actual written history was written a thousand years later by French people. Uh, <laughs> but most of the places that people think are the sites that are associated with Arthur, apart from Tintagel, were all Roman settlements, uh, like huh. Cadbury, like all of the other places are like, oh, this is a place where they also had a huge Roman base. They had Roman baths. They had a, a huge amphitheater. That cookie cutter town that they were putting everywhere. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. When, and it also, I, I feel like there's a concept that at least I've had in general of once Rome, it was a, a kingdom, then a republic, then an empire. And once it was an empire, there was just constant usurping and people trying to take over from elsewhere and so like you said patrick about these barbarian armies where maybe just romans trying to grab power various places yeah uh, it, it also seems like there was was it just constant civil war like shakespeare's julius caesar about that civil war just constantly guys killing each other to try to take it over depends on when you're talking about some periods much more so than others the third century is was absolutely full of that kind of thing like i think only one or two emperors in the third century died a natural death like oh, you got you had this one string where there was a new emperor every six months or so and it's because the army made emperors you know the, and if you've got a successful general like let's say okay you've got all these goths pouring over the danube frontier and you're and you're Fucking a general go out. coming in here yeah, they're crying everywhere playing your loud music are you sad why is your music so just, loud just looking out here looking like the cure uh they these you've got an are like these invading goths who come in and you're a roman general and you go out and you just whip the goths asses like and your soldiers are like well Maybe you should be emperor. And you're like, you know what? Maybe I should be emperor. And so right. this happens over and over and over again. It's one of the things that's kind of a structural problem with the later Roman Empire is like, how do you delegate authority if you're an emperor? How do you give somebody an army and send them off to go do this thing, knowing that if they're good at it, if they win, then maybe they take over. Maybe maybe you end up poisoned or, or you know, stabbed through the mouth. Right. Like, because, again, the Roman Empire was huge. Yeah. It was really, <laughs> really big. It went a really long way. I feel like if you drove the length of the Roman Empire now, it would take you two weeks to drive. Oh, yeah. And imagine that on foot, even though their roads were very good. The ro- Really, the Roman roads were amazing. But even then, you're you're still walking them. Yeah, we'll, we'll link a map of whatever the largest extent was of it. But it's it's a, a couple continents, you know, yeah. overlapping it's, into the whole far. Mediterranean, just all around just it. Just the whole thing. It's yeah. the only time in history that the entire Mediterranean has been under the rule of a single political unit. So yeah. and then it extends way beyond that, too. It goes all the way to northern Britain. It goes all the way to the Sahara in the south. It goes all the way from, you know, Gibraltar to the Syrian desert. It goes all yeah. the, oh, also all the way down to the last cataract, uh, to the first cataract of the Nile. There's along the Red Sea coast, like yeah. the Roman Empire is enormous. You have the army as an incredibly powerful institution uh, with huge numbers of people and huge amounts of money devoted to it. But th- what made the Roman army work was the supply chain. It's so they wouldn't march without fish sauce that is basically only made kind of around the Mediterranean coast. And if you're on the frontier of the Rhine and you got to get that fish sauce, how does that work? Well, you got river boats, you got roads, you got huge numbers of people whose sole job it is to move this god awful fish sauce from <laughs> Spain all the way to like what's now Germany, you know? And so, wow. but that's, that's kind of. At a really basic level, what makes the Roman Empire the Roman Empire is the fact that you could do that. Right. They were just yeah. really, really, really good at logistics. Yeah. And big movement of people. Yeah. And, and stuff yeah. and making sure that there's boot leather in the right places. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah olive just, oil to everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like real basic shit. But people who are really good at lists. Yeah. The Romans were great at lists. Really kind good of in at general. lists. Prior to the Romans technical writing was not like a big thing. But the Romans had a whole tradition of technical writing about architecture and agriculture and all of these different, like very kind of esoteric, but very practical subjects. The Romans did all of that. Like not a lot of it has survived because medieval monks didn't really care about it. Like they weren't, medieval monks were not super concerned with like the best way to grow wine uh, wine grapes. If you're like in, if you're in Britain and you've got this manuscript, like you're not going to copy that one. That's not going to be the thing that survives. Because of the weather, not because of, they they respected alcohol. (laughs) They respected alcohol. 
yeah. Yeah, but, they, but they could if they couldn't grow it themselves they probably weren't going to save the manuscript yeah but like <laughs> there was a huge tradition of this kind of technical writing that's like deeply boring stuff one of the things that we had talked about beforehand was concrete how to make incredible concrete and underwater concrete too like there was like they could make concrete that's set perfectly well underwater like these deeply technical and high and really difficult kind of tasks like the romans were great at all of that stuff and it's one of the things that kind of marks them out right arches as well I, mm -hmm. there is a misconception that romans invented arches they did not but mostly pre-roman arches were decorative and also people didn't trust them and the romans were like we're going to build our entire architecture around the arch mm -hmm. and right. we're going to do these everywhere. big domes yeah uh, the, all of the the domed cathedrals that we see now are based on on uh roman basilicae which is where most christian worship happened at, at first they just were like oh the the roman basilicae became it was the model for before the that it was like a they were basilicas were law courts or administrative buildings or something like that yeah oh wow well and, yeah because that uh that concrete thing like i would love to see some kind of movie or something about the inventor of it if we could pick a person <laughs> because it's it's this weird process where their concrete was stronger than modern concrete, and we only discovered why in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's because they mixed in volcanic ash and then exposed that to seawater, and it created another compound in it called aluminum tobermorite. And we like finally found out how the Romans did it, because they were so good at it. It's crazy. It's wild. Yeah. It is really amazing how their power over water, I think, is something that, be mm. because we take running water for granted, it is so hard to make running water happen. Building the aqueducts, building the baths, building these sewerage systems. The Roman cities were the cleanest cities until modern day. Mm -hmm. And they had street cleaners and that people's jobs were to make sure that these things were clean. They had public restrooms. Oh, Everything was swept away. They had very extensive, like, basically they had uh, streams of water running underneath the toilets. You were shitting next to other people. <laughs> no uh, stalls. No stalls yeah, at I all. Mean yeah, it's just uh, like a wooden bench with a hole in it. But there was water running underneath, which meant that everything just got flushed away. That, that's essentially the men's bathroom at is, most stadiums. Right, so that's exactly. Fine. Yeah, which is no more that. disgusting than if, any urinal. If you go to Ostia, <laughs> out the, the port city of Rome, you can go and sit on one right now. Looks like it'd still work, too. I mean, oh. depending on your depending on how you feel about doing that, like in the open air. It's like a fun trip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, because we uh, in in the range of things about how their cities being great, uh, there was something called the Cloaca Maxima, which was the the main main sewer of the city of Rome. It was built in the 500s BC, and there's still a trickle of the modern city of Rome sewage system running through it, which because it was built well enough to kind of still work 2,500 yeah. years later. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is this is kind of true of Roman cities in general. Is like they knew what they were doing, and they knew what they were doing not just in kind of the way that they built them, but the way Way that they cited them like yeah. in terms of their access to, to water in terms of their access to major transport like natural transportation routes so like the way that they place them along rivers and at port and kind of at the mouths of rivers like because roman cities in addition to being just hyper livable places in general were also perfectly suited to take in the things that they needed to survive because cities are, are deeply artificial creations right like people are not supposed to be living to get like packed kind of one after the other, you mm -hmm. have to get food from someplace. You need to you need to be able to bring in the supplies necessary to, to make it possible for you to live in a city. Roman yeah. cities were all perfectly placed to do that because you had to bring in grain from elsewhere. You had to bring in vegetables. You had to bring in wine. Uh, you had to bring in meat. All of this stuff had to come from somewhere else to get there. Roman cities were perfectly placed to do that efficiently and effectively. To the point where I believe again in like the 1700s, the first sort of antiquarians in the UK looking at the way that the Roman roads were laid out, one of the base explanations for it was still, again, in the, in like the, the 1700s, 1700s yeah. magic. It was, oh, <laughs> uh, they built them along ley lines. I'm inventing this thing called ley lines, which is energy lines that run oh, throughout yeah. the universe. We'll and the Romans built their, their roads along them because there's, <laughs> that's the only explanation is magic. They, there's no way that they could have been this good at surveying. Right. It and non-Muggle be... Romans were in charge of these. Right, Romans. exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was, well, what's fascinating is like there was a really recent study done on uh, on this that was like the areas that Roman roads touched are still drastically more economically developed now in Europe than places that were not touched by Roman roads. So oh that, that speaks to one of two things. Either 
first that like infrastructure development 2000 years ago still has like long term knock on effects for economic development now or that the the way Roman roads were laid out was so uh, led them to such to places that were just so much better than everywhere else in terms of their access to resources, like whether healthiness, whatever. One of those two things that was was the result. Either it was the infrastructure itself or it was that they just picked the right spots. I feel like we a lot of things we're talking about are relatively recent discoveries about the Romans, like that study and the mm -hmm. concrete and everything else. Why, why are we still finding things out about them? They're from so long ago. I know, I know it's like, it feels like maybe a dumb question, but it, it's sort of amazing that there's still so much to learn about yeah. these I people. I mean, I do think that part of the reason that we're still learning so much about them is that there are so many people studying them. Mm -hmm. It is very, very interesting to a lot of people. And also a lot of people are studying them because there is a lot of stuff left over. Yeah. You know, that archaeologically, they're very, very present in the record. They left a lot of literature. Every now and again, they still find stuff because, I don't know, they find a Roman Egyptian mummy and then they, they take off its wrappings and then you're like, oh, it's it's a thing that somebody wrote that we didn't even know about. Yeah, I think before this, you'd emailed about that there's some new Pompeii finds, which is partly preserved yeah. because of the volcano, but it's just new crazy frescoes that we're right. finding. Oh, right. yeah. And by the way, I feel like we have undersold the horniness of the Romans. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, they loved uh, sex and pornography. And there's so much graffiti in Pompeii that's just like... Just dicks everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. So many dicks and so many like i'm a prostitute and this is where you can find me or like my wife is a whore and i hate her and oh wow yeah um and they had somebody to chisel it too right you know? oh like, yeah really truly it, this is not you know? painted necessarily this is somebody who was like i'm taking the day i'm taking the day and i'm gonna do it that's an investment yeah <laughs> Um, but it, but it, yeah, all that's preserved. We yeah, all of it is preserved, and yeah, we're so lucky to have Pompeii. And again, Vindolanda, I think, is an astonishing site. And that, but there's they're also everywhere. They really went to so many places, and because they had this system of like pretty much rebuilding everything, starting from scratch, or building a new town where they decided was the most efficient, there is a very specific Romanness. Oh, that is yeah. very easy to spot. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Every now and then we have a very hot summer. They're happening more and more. <laughs> and one of the few good things about global warming is that every time that happens, all of these new archaeological sites get uncovered because uh, any ditch uh, will, the grasses will dry up less than oh. uh, around it. So suddenly you're like, oh, my field that I've <laughs> been living next to for 20 years has a Roman villa in it. And I never knew. And now I know because. Oh, yeah. like our dying earth is like, here's the Roman stuff. Right, exactly. Like, yeah, from the and then, oh, your cousin oh, got a drone and he's flying it above your field. And then suddenly you're like, oh, it's a That's actually a really a big deal now is like aerial photographs are one of the big ways that you can spot ar potential archaeological sites. And now that every wow. asshole has a drone, like you can, you, it's much easier to find those kinds of things. But I think, I think you hit on the really, the really big piece of it is that there's just so much stuff. Yeah. And it's, I think studying the Romans is really well suited to an era kind of big data and of being able to look at lots and lots and lots of things together. Yeah. Um, so pottery is a good example of this. Like the Romans have just left so, so, so much pottery. That's really well suited to an era of Excel spreadsheets. Right, yeah. Because like, in the past, out... there was this guy, Dragendorf, who did the first on-paper spreadsheets of Roman pottery. And I feel like that guy would be so mad to know now that you <laughs> yeah, just easy. put it all just into a Just populate cells. Just click populate <laughs> cells. Like, that's the Romans are really well suited for that kind of thing. Uh, because there is so much of it, as opposed to like, so that when the Romans leave Britain, people stop building in stone, the Anglo-Saxons come in and they're mm -hmm. building in different spots. But like the difference between a Roman settlement and an Anglo-Saxon settlement, a Roman settlement has like stone foundations and well laid out streets. And you've got your temple here and you've got your and you've got your your baths over here. An Anglo-Saxon settlement is literally just stains in the ground. It's post it's holes, such like a rotted out wooden posts. Yeah, holes. they just dug a wow. hole in the ground and built a house in it. And then they didn't know how to wheel throw pottery. It's all handmade pottery. I saw a picture actually online uh, recently of reproductions of Iron Age pottery. And I was like, this is what the Dark Age pottery looks like. I've never seen it mm -hmm. actually look like what it was supposed to look like okay. because it just rots in the ground because they're uh -huh. also firing it at a much lower temperature. So it is very, very delicate. 
yeah. they are not a sponsor. We can trash them as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck the Saxons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like, yeah. And so you have this contrast between what comes after the Romans practically everywhere and the Romans. The Romans are just so much more materially complex than the world that follows them. They left us yeah. so much more crap to look at. And now we have so many more tools to look at that crap. Like we can look <laughs> at the, we, if you've got a well-preserved amphora, we can look inside it, test the residue that's inside it and know right. what was in it. You've got all of these kind of new emerging tools, whether it's just being able to analyze a lot of data or create new data from things like that. And the Roman world is really well suited to that kind of large scale analysis. Even in the absence of finding new texts, the material remains can tell us so much more than they could 50 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And even the material remains that we already have. Yeah. There's so much going back and looking at old. The problem with archaeology is that once you dig, you can never do it again. And so right. there has been a lot of like, oh, let's go back and test this stuff that we've just got. That we've already shelves. got. It's yeah. just sitting yeah. in the back room of some like county museum someplace. Yeah, yeah. The Romans are interesting. The <laughs> the best worst people. <laughs> Folks, that is the episode for this week. My immense thanks to Siobhan Thompson and Patrick Wyman for spending time with me on a topic that they are uniquely wise about and uniquely funny about all at once. That was just amazing. And in our food notes, you'll be treated to all kinds of cracked and non-cracked sources that we drew on today. There is a wall of great stuff there, and I think it speaks to the fact we touched on that there are new discoveries about the ancient Romans all of the time, even though, uh, you know, like kind of news about the president and so on drowns it out. There's a lot of cool stuff to learn about it constantly. Two things I want to pick out in particular. One of them is an episode of Patrick Wyman's podcast where he talks to uh, Kyle Harper. Kyle Harper is a historian who's written a recent book about the Romans and climate change. And the idea that ancient Rome was able to build and do so much stuff with so many people, it actually created pollution that did some shifting of their climate. Uh, there's also a piece in there about how studies have found traces of that pollution in the ice in Greenland today. Uh, so it's an amazing phenomenon. And uh, I don't know, maybe climate change is relevant to right now. What do you think? We also touched on the idea of the Roman concept of race. And we're going to link a piece called Himmler's Antiquity from the Los Angeles Review of Books, which uh, kind of looks at how the study of Rome in modern times has, at times, been used for <laughs> nefarious ends, in particular dealing with which races, uh, you know where that's going. Especially because it's called Himmler's Antiquity, it's pretty clear. But it's a really fascinating thing, and it's a thing that even today on the internet is debated pretty vociferously. There was a video that the BBC put out in 2017 that depicted a Roman family as being multicultural. And a lot of people online were up in arms about it because basically they've seen the movie Gladiator and they think all Romans were white. They didn't even really have that schema, but also they were a much more diverse place than those people think. We are also linking Siobhan's work and her Twitter account. It is at Vorney Tom, and she's very, very funny on there. And we are linking Patrick's podcasts. One is called Tides of History from Wondery, and the other is called The Fall of Rome. Both get into these massive processes, and uh, they put like a narrative spin on them that I really enjoy. It makes it very human. And then also a lot of experts come in and bring uh, what they know about the subject and what they've discovered is new about the subject, too. It's a great show. And what else is in our footnotes? A very, very exciting footnote for this show. As we told you before, we are going on our first ever Cracked Podcast tour. We are heading on the road, and I I'm going to come see you in the Midwest there. How's that sound? Hey, you're correct. It sounds great. Uh, we're doing shows uh, Thursday, April 11th, Lincoln Hall in Chicago. And then Friday, April 12th, we will be at Amsterdam Bar and Hall in St. Paul, Minnesota. Tickets for both those are linked in the food notes. And I, I really hope I'll see you there. I can't wait to do those uh, very specialized, customized shows that we're going to do in each city and have the best time doing it. It's going to be great. In the meantime, till I hit the road, our theme music is Chicago Falcon by the Budos Band. This episode was engineered by Jordan Duffy and edited by Chris Souza. If you love this episode, that's great. If you hated it, let me know about it on social media. That's right, social media, a thing the Romans had a version of in the sense that they did that graffiti everywhere about who had sex with who. Uh, but I know that's way, way different from Twitter. That it, That is at least 2 or 3% different from Twitter. My own Twitter account, I keep it clean there. It's at Alex Schmitty. My Instagram is at Alex Schmittstagram. And I'm on the wider internet at my website, alexschmitty.com. 
And I'm happy to say we will be back next week with more Cracked Podcast. So how about that? Talk to you then. This has been an Earwolf production, executive produced by Scott Ackerman, Chris Bannon, and Colin Anderson. For more information and content, visit Earwolf.com. Hi, I'm Paul F. Tompkins. My podcast, Spontaneous Nation, is wrapping up at episode 200, and that final show will drop on Monday, January 21st. We'll have one of our favorite guests in for an interview and an extra-long improv set featuring an expanded lineup of Spontaneous Nation All-Stars. Whether you've been a fan from day one or you've never even heard the show before, I hope you'll listen to this very special episode. Happy New Year!